There's nothing quite like hearing news of a newborn baby. The hopes, the dreams and the excitement. And while we understand that new life is nothing short of a miracle, do we really understand just how clever and amazing each human is? I'm continually blown away by the wonders of child development and human resilience. But what determines how it's going to go? How many parents of newborns gaze down upon their precious bundles and think, oh my goodness, he's going to be a serial killer. I mean, how are they to know? How, have you ever wondered what makes a person the person they are, their own individual and unique self? And where does mental health fit and how can we make it turn out for the best? Well, from infancy to about the age of four, a healthy bub will explore the world in the true meaning of the word, explore. They will mouth, touch, babble, crawl, climb, they'll explore. And with each exploration, they begin to create an internal representation of how the world is and how they are in the world. They begin to store information like putting bits of things in separate boxes in their head. Picture a toddler playing and crawling on a lawn. Imagine she finds a warm, squishy dog poo. Imagine the delight of rubbing her fingers through it, immersing herself, perhaps even in the taste of it. She's authentic, alive, and totally absorbed. There's no judging part here. It's just her and the poo. But that doesn't last forever. From as early as the age of four to six, a child can do something and at the same time, think about what they're doing. They develop what is called a stream of consciousness. They develop the ability to monitor themselves. So in a way, they start to have two parts of themselves. One part that is doing, playing with or eating the poo, and the other part that is thinking about what they're doing or commenting and judging, like, oh my goodness, I shouldn't be doing this, mum will freak. Two parts of themselves that speak two different languages. The doing part speaks social speak on the outside of them, things that other people can hear. The other self uses inner speech that comments like an inside commentator. And it's the play between these two parts of the child self that will help determine the sort of person they will become. It is through these two parts that a child grows from functioning without a care, authentic, alive and totally absorbed, to a teen or youth who is ever aware and hypersensitive to the judgment of others. So by the time our little poo-eating girl is a teen and she's on the way to the car with her L plates, she stands in a warm, squishy dog poo. Oh, the disgust and repulsion. No longer able to find joy in the experience at all. She is hyper aware and sensitive to judgment. So much change to that sense of joy and authenticity. Delight and immersion have transformed to disgust and repulsion. So how can we help youth navigate through the changes, through the development of their personality, and help them maintain some delight and authenticity with the just right amount of judgment and disgust? Well, as a child learns, bits of them in the world around them are taken in and stored in their head boxes. Things need to fit into the spaces and categories we already have, or we need to create new spaces and categories to fit new things. Imagine a storage room full of boxes, all labelled with things like my home, my family, my school, dog poo. The bits that fit are easy, we just pop them right in. But what to do with the bits that don't fit? Sometimes, to fit things comfortably into our understanding, Brains have to chop a bit off here and exaggerate this big bit there. Sometimes we have to twist an idea or experience to make it fit. And sometimes we just have to completely ignore it and not take it on board. Let's say I'm a good person, but I just ignored a friend who was being bullied. Ignoring a friend may not fit into my box about my good self. So I can ignore that I ignored them. I can justify or twist saying I was too busy or didn't want to get involved. Or I can go back, apologise and make restitution. I can start to twist my head boxes to make parts of myself satisfied so that things make sense. 
the way we've taken the world is not always accurate and rational. Wounds and scars build up and we begin to missee ourselves and the world. But our boxes are our boxes and we will sort and store them in ways that make sense to us. And as if all that head box juggling isn't tricky enough, we also have to prioritise head boxes around life-threatening things. Having a dangerous event leaves no time for pondering. So when something truly traumatic happens, it can severely mess with the order of things. If someone does not feel safe and settled and loved, then it becomes very hard to sort and store new information into multiple separate boxes. Instead, it's easier just to go with two boxes, safe or dangerous. For a child who is unsafe, learning the alphabet is deprioritised and learning to hide, run, swear, yell, fight, they may become the well-worn pathway. And if the danger comes from someone you should be able to trust, like a parent or carer, or your parents are at war with each other, how on earth do you store that? The brain becomes not so much disorganised, but organised to prioritise attack and mistrust, to be on guard and alert. Damp, dark thoughts appear when things are trying to be made to fit. Headbox storage systems can become fractured. The ability to do something and to reflect or think about what they're doing becomes harder. The place where the two parts of the self meet to make sense of the world becomes messy and the solutions found can be unhealthy, plain silly or downright catastrophic. In Australia, one in 37 children experience abuse. That rate is seven times higher for Indigenous children. And the rates of substantiated child abuse continue to grow. Then, over the teen years, the brain gets new cells and oh so much more information and more potential. The mass of neurons a bub is born with are organised, pruned and myelin coated to allow the brain to develop information superhighways that permit faster reaction times than ever before. So head boxes can get created, chopped and changed really quickly. The brain changes in its social and pleasure centres, making teens more preoccupied with others, more dissatisfied with their lot, and needing to seek out more extreme forms of pleasure. Louder music, sweeter sweets, and more dramatic dramas. Head boxes get rapidly rearranged and reprioritised. All of these changes during the teen years can, like danger or trauma, also bring a certain vulnerability with regard to mental health. The head box is about what scary change. No longer afraid of loud noises and the boogeyman, teens fear social death, failure and judgement. Some teens become fearless, risking life and limb to find dizzy heights or to impress that special someone. The pleasure and motivation changes around sleep patterns and it's harder to get teens going in the morning. Relationships change and even the most sensible young person may bend the rules or do something illogical because the desire to belong or to fit in is so intense. So intense it almost physically hurts. Head boxes can topple. For many reasons, teens can feel like they're going crazy every day. For a few, the struggle to manage their head boxes and their lives becomes overwhelming and they can tip over into having a diagnosable mental health concern. You may have heard the recent statistics that indicate 12% of 13 to 17 year olds have thought about suicide. Over 4% have taken steps towards making an attempt. So from the very privileged position I take as a clinical and forensic psychologist, my job is to try to change the way a person sees themselves in the world so that they can get back in touch with authenticity and delight. To help a young person establish a solid sense of themselves where their judging self and their authentic doing self are no longer fractured. To help understand how they have stacked their boxes and help them to restack or to make some sturdier box sorting solutions. First, I need to meet them at their place not their home or their school or their favourite haunt, but the place inside them. The place where they have built 
their internal representation of themselves. The place where they decide who they are and the place where they judge themselves. I need to understand how they've sorted their boxes. We might sit, chat, draw, take a walk, laugh awkwardly, but I listen. I listen to them speak. I listen to both parts of themselves, their spoken word and their inner voice. Together, we highlight things that don't seem to make sense and join the dots differently. We join the dots differently between thing A and thing B so that there is less barbaric self-criticism and more tender, gentle acceptance. So from their place and with scientific, evidence-based psychological knowledge of their age, history and symptoms, everything begins to make sense. It makes sense that they see and feel things in a certain way that others may not. It makes sense that unless they have the latest gadget, they're socially undesirable. It makes sense they feel compelled to check social media till the wee hours of the morning. And it makes sense that they cannot stomach walking past that certain girl at school. From the inside place, we can create platforms where they can stand back and see themselves with more clarity. We build scaffolding together so we can see the same memories but experience them from a different point of view. When we visit their space, we can explore it together. We can share hypotheses. Maybe that's why when your sister whines, you feel like punching the lights out. Maybe that's why you think you have to be skinny to be worthy. Perhaps. Together, we rearrange head boxes and I hold on to some things for them while they go about trying to reorganise to make their box sorting systems more robust. These days, as an adult, my own fears and funny shaped boxes still live deep inside my core and they call me and push me to do well, but they do not cripple me. These days, my fears can still motivate me and these days, my fears are more broad and perhaps more worldly. These days, as an adult, I fear for young people needing crisis mental health care. I fear for young people stuck in a mental health system that doesn't take time to scaffold their inside place. I fear for young people in unsafe families or those caught between warring parents and the court. Court systems offer little scaffolding for the inside place. I fear that even though we have psychological science and evidence to prove that we can efficiently tackle fears, most people receive suboptimal care. Perhaps well-intentioned, but suboptimal. Services may offer care and support, but what about treatment? I fear that while our government pauses to review mental health services in Australia, that they may be content with current systems and overlook the special needs of children and adolescents. That they will continue to fragment and separate mental health, child protection and court systems and create barriers rather than safety. What youth in mental health crisis need is a safe place. A safe place on the outside of them that scaffolds the place on the inside of them. Where they can learn more about their outside self and their inside commentating self. A place where people have youth specific knowledge and know about development and how boxes are stacked at different ages. A place where youth can have safe and guided experiences to help them restack old boxes, untwist, open new boxes and learn new ways of coping. A place where people are kind but do not shy away from difficult conversations because they might be emotive. If we truly want to celebrate youth mental health and create mental robustness, we need to have people and systems that make youth safe enough to be able to think without relying solely on their danger boxes. We need to take time to help them with caring support while we give them proven scientific ways to restack their boxes when they wobble. It's only with systems that combine safety, care and science that we can disentangle the fracturedness of trauma or overwhelming experiences of youth so that we can see sadness, fear, shame and anger slowly replaced with the just right amount of happy, warm, dog pooey delight. 
and that would be something to celebrate.